I've got Matthew 17 and verse 20 for the message tonight. I want to continue our study as we began last week. And I trust that you understood and appreciated that revelation and vision and blessing that the sister shared with us concerning how that we need to be in prayer for one another and for the ministry because people are still departing from the faith even since last week friends even since last week I don't say trials are easy I'm just telling you the way it is and not only here but in other places I guess you read the article in the paper. I don't read the paper. Someone sent this to me. About this individual who was traveling about the country for, I guess, a couple of years, speaking against the gays. And now she has turned back from that strong opposition. I don't say she should have been out there doing that. That isn't the point. Just telling you what she did do about the gays teaching in the schools and all. And... A nationwide campaign now the report is at least she has backed off of that in saying now my philosophy or belief is live and let live well you can read it for yourself but people are drawing back is what I'm saying all over just as well as they are here so I want to continue what we were dealing with last time I've basically dealt with the admonition to the ministers that is the word ministers, and I want tonight now to bring the admonition to the whole body ministry, or the ministers of the body, which is everyone. I trust you already know that there is such a book around here somewhere, pink cover, entitled Charismatic Body Ministry. If you haven't read that, you should, because the author points out how that God is restoring in this end time the ministry of the whole body. So we're addressing ourselves to the whole body tonight because, you see, you can draw back from the faith just like some of the ministers are doing. We encourage you not to do that. We encourage you to listen like this admonition we just got from this sister. I mean, did you really heed that? Are we so busy listening to the next prophecy or whatever that came? I said last week, I'm heeding what the Spirit says to the church. And when people fall away, it just drives me closer to the Word, closer to the Lord. It increases my determination that it doesn't happen to me. And it also increases and rekindles the fear of God in my heart. These are end times. This is serious what's happening. You've got to keep the faith. Of all places, here we must keep the faith at all costs. And it's the revelation given to her related if the enemy the wolf can get to the shepherds we understand under shepherds don't we the shepherds then he'll have free license to do what he wants to the flock so we need to take seriously what's happening he's really striking out at ministers these bodily afflictions like you know one brother has been going through for months Look what the devil was trying to do to wreck his faith in the divine healing message and shake some of you people, your faith. And then we've had ministers departing from the faith for one reason or another. And it's happened since last message last week again. These are serious times. You better gird up the loins of your mind and decide whether or not you want to go all the way with God now. Count the cost while you have time because it's costly. The rewards are great. But the enemy is working overtime in this end time and working in ways you don't even know. Just to make a point and then I'll drop it, you don't know what I've been going through physically for a long time. But you see, God is sufficient and His Word is true. That's all I need to say. If some suspect something, then all right. But there's no problem. I don't mean that because I practice what I preach. There are things that go on in the realm of word ministry that some of you know nothing about because in practicing what we preach, we don't come and say, hey, sympathize with me. There were only $10 in the offering last week. Or something's wrong with my back. Or whatever. 
I'm just saying that the enemy is working overtime against the word ministers. So pray for us as we pray for you. You've got to keep the faith. Well, somebody's going to keep it, and by the grace of God, I'm going to keep it. There's no point in standing up here for all these years and preaching faith and then giving up over a physical trial or a financial trial or a mental trial or a domestic trial or a people trial or any other kind of trial. Praise the Lord. Positive confession. Somebody wrote a book about that. It has a blue cover. Walking in victory 365 days a year. You can do it. Praise God, you can do it. There's no question you can do it. It does work. So I want to encourage you tonight to stop looking at circumstances, others and your own, or even misreading, misinterpreting God's circumstances, because it will tempt you to do what some are doing, depart from the faith. Now Jesus encourages us here in Matthew 17 and verse 20, that if we'll just use... Faith as a grain of mustard seed, then nothing will be impossible to us. Now, that's nothing is impossible in the physical, financial, mental, spiritual, whatever realm. Nothing. Amen. Because faith, he said, here brings all things into the realm of possibility. We've preached that for years. We just need to hear it again. All things into the realm of possibility and actuality. It will actually come to pass. Faith takes the M from impossible and leaves the possible. Faith takes the dis away from disease and leaves you at ease again. That's what the word means. It's two words. Dis-ease, like disappoint and all of that. Appoint, disappoint. When you are sick, you are diseased, And when God heals you, you're back at ease. And faith will do that. Faith removes the T from can't and leaves nothing but can. I can do all things through Christ. Amen. Faith removes the un from unable, the M from imperfect, the N from inadequate, and you can make your own list. Because with faith, he said, all things are possible. And without faith, there's a good deal that isn't possible. And one of the things that is quite significant. Without faith, he says, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6. In Romans 14, 23, that which is not motivated by or based upon faith is sin. Everything you think, say, or do, apart from it being motivated by or based on faith is sin. That means when you begin to doubt, it's sin. I mean, settle the matter. You just might as well settle it now at the beginning of the message. Is that when you begin to doubt, as some do, if Mark eleven twenty four 24 is really going to work for you, you've waited five years, five months, seven years, whatever. When you begin to question the validity of any promise of God, any promise of God, when you begin to move away from the promises back to the pills, when you begin to question whether or not that loved one you claimed is ever going to be saved or delivered. They're getting worse. Just settle it. You're sinning. You are sinning, and sin displeases God. You might as well tell God, just put another black mark against my ledger account there in heaven because I'm getting ready to doubt you again, and that's sin. I'd rather choose to believe my feelings and circumstances, what the devil is saying, than your word, your clear word. Oh, I know to doubt displeases you and it's sin, Lord, but I'm just tired waiting. It's been seven months, seven years, and I'm going to take the easy route. I'm going to draw back a little like some are doing. I'll take the easy way. You might as well say all of that because that's what he's saying about it. You better believe it. At the throne of heaven, he's saying, put out another black mark. He's doubting me. He's sinning. Because when you begin to question any promise of God, any promise of God, you are as guilty of fulfilling 1 Timothy 4.1, which we know by heart, as any other person who sits under the word for years, like some have, and then rejects the word and departs from the faith. 1 Timothy 4.1, what is it? For the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Why? They give heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. You bring yourself just one step 
closer to the permanent fulfillment of that prediction in your life every time you begin to doubt God because you are departing from the faith just that much. I'll repeat that. That brings you, whenever you doubt God, one step closer to fulfilling that prophecy that you will totally depart from the faith, fulfilling it in your life in a permanent way, as some are doing. You see, they all start somewhere doubting this, questioning that, raising questions in their mind. They don't always articulate them. Sometimes they stand in the pulpit and keep preaching faith and they're doubting in their heart. You're just coming one step closer to departing from the faith completely. Because every time you doubt God, take the matter of healing. You claim a promise of healing. It isn't manifested soon enough for you, whatever it is, taking your glasses off so you can get the restriction removed from your license all the way to whatever the sickness is. When you open the door in the midst of the pain or the trial or whatever to doubt, then you are guilty of departing from the faith. That's 1 Timothy 4.1. He said in the last days they'll do it. They're doing it here. When you doubt that God will judge you or chasten, if you want both aspects of it, if you begin to doubt that God will really press down the screws on you if you fall into that fornication with your girlfriend or vice versa, or you begin to criticize, or you hold resentment, or you cheat a little on your income tax, when you begin to doubt that he'll do what he says, you're departing from the faith. Because he said, here's what I'll do if you don't walk the straight and narrow. And when a parent, our parents, do not deal with their children the way they should, that is, do not obey the word of God and discipline them when they need it, when they begin to allow themselves to become rather permissive about certain habits and practices that the children are picking up at school or out in the world with their playmates, when they begin to let them have their own way, they are departing from the faith at that point because that's what the Word of God says that you are to do, you know, and then you don't do that. And we could just go on and on and multiply examples. What I'm saying is whenever you doubt what God has said, and if you disobey Him, you're doubting it, or you wouldn't do it. Then you are departing from the faith at that point, and you're coming one step closer to a permanent fulfillment of 1 Timothy 4.1 in your life, because it's being fulfilled all over the world in the lives of professing Christians. They are departing from the faith, not always from a religion, but from the faith, what the Bible says to do or not to do. And it's true of a minister. If he can't trust God for his finances, then he's departing from the faith at that point because nothing is more clearly taught in the Word of God than that God will meet your material needs. And that's addressed first to ministers who are to be examples to others. Read to whom he's speaking there in Matthew 6. He's speaking, first of all, to those who are ministering the Word. And so we could just go on and on. I heard a broadcast not too long ago where the minister came on the air, was on one of those religious programs. He came on with Philippians 4.19, praise the Lord. You know, that was so unusual. My God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. And then praise the Lord, he said, you see, the children of God don't have to beg for their finances or needs. Praise the Lord. On the radio I heard this. It wasn't my program either. <laughs> He says, the children of God don't have to beg for their needs. And he went on and closed with about five minutes of begging for his needs. You have to, you know, tape it and play it back to believe that you're hearing what you're hearing. Faith is just a stereotype term to most ministers anymore. It has no biblical meaning at all to most of them. It's like this phrase, born again, that every Tom, Dick, and Harry is using today. And they don't know anything about born again because their lives are not changed. So he went on and said, you know, well, I need your help, financial help, very badly, and I need a lot of big, generous offerings to keep this ministry of power on the air. And you do what the Lord tells you about sending in an offering, but be sure and send it. <laughs> in other words, do what God says. If he says no, send it anyway, is what he was saying. He closed with, all you need is have faith in God. I mean, they don't even know what they're saying. Have faith in God. Contradicted himself twice. Quoting Philippians 4.19, have faith in God, that's all you need, and then spend five minutes begging for finances. 
Well, what I'm saying is, ministers are departing from the faith at that point when they can't trust God for their finances. And so whether it's finances or healing or the salvation of a loved one or whatever, when you disbelieve whatever God has said and you begin to question that, then you're departing from the faith. And that's what we want to see first of all, because ministers, some of them who embraced the faith message through the seminars, through the literature, were introduced to the faith message that way, or through the tapes going out, the automatic list and whatever. Some now are departing from the faith. I received a letter, I think I mentioned last week, from a person who follows the faith message and said, some of the ministers around here are going soft on the faith message, and now what they're doing, they are accusing people like yourself who preach an uncompromising word as lacking in love. You know, because they're going soft on the message, and the reason they're going soft is because of its cost. And so thank God for people who can recognize that those men are compromising the message. And generally when they write, they express how that they're blessed by the strong uncompromising word that comes out of faith assembly and how that it's enabled them to stand fast in these end times. I mean sometimes from raising the dead to you name it, not going bankrupt. This does happen because of a strong message and uncompromising word. Well, I want to say that God is going to judge these people not only for departing from the faith themselves, but for also criticizing those who love God enough that they will not compromise His word. And He's going to judge them for trying to get others to follow their example because no man ever stands in the pulpit and just gives his testimony, you know, gives his opinion. Well, you can believe it or not, it's Sunday again. Here's 30 minutes of what I think about this passage. No, He's trying to get people to follow Him or He wouldn't be up there. So God's going to charge those ministers who depart from the faith, and that's what some are doing, and charging others who won't compromise the word with a lack of love, he's going to charge them not only for departing, but trying to get others to depart. Well, it isn't only ministers who are trying to get others to depart. A brother came up here not too long ago and shared with me. He said a man that used to sit under this ministry to some extent, I don't know how much, but I've seen him a number of times sitting out there in the congregation while we were over in the other building, he said he came to me some time ago. I was in debt. And he said, I want to get you out of debt. I want to pay all of your bills. You know, just pay them off. He said, but I want you to do two little things for me. And one is, put your glasses back on and admit you've been wrong about this divine healing business. And secondly, stop attending faith assembly and I'll pay all of your bills off. There he is trying to buy somebody's faith. He isn't going to steal it. He's going to pay for them to doubt and disbelieve. Well, he had sense enough to tell him it was too late now. He should have bribed him 10 years ago or something. He's been hearing the word of faith too long, so he's going to stay with the word, Mark eleven twenty four. You know, because his eyes weren't manifested yet, well, why don't you just put your glasses back on, admit you're wrong, and I'll get you out of debt? Why, if you can't hear the old serpent's tongue then you've never heard the devil speak. And so this Job's friend, you see, is not only guilty of departing from the faith himself, but he is so far removed from faith that he's opposing it and trying to pay others to give it up. When I heard that, I was reminded of Matthew 18 and verse 6, where Jesus is dealing with causing little ones to stumble who believe in him. He said, if you cause one to stumble, it's going to be too bad for you in the day of judgment. But you see, we're all his children. So the principle will apply to anybody that tries to rob us of the faith or try to get us to stumble. He says in Matthew 18 and verse 6, For whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, one of the children, and we're his children, which believe in me, if they offend one who believes in me, it were better for him that a millstone would be hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now that's a warning to anybody here, anybody hears the tapes. It's bad enough when you depart from the faith. It's bad enough. But when you try to justify why you won't pay the cost and try to get the children who believe in him, try to get them to stumble and depart from the faith and go back to that dog's vomit of unbelief and doubt. He said the last state of that person will be worse than the first who turns back. And so the Holy Spirit wants you to know, dear friends, 
that this message that God has given us in this end time, this message we stress and emphasize and preach week after week in some form or another, is to be taken seriously because it is serious with God. It's not some trite matter of choice like so many people seem to think it is. I mean, people come in here and sit for years and think it's just a matter of choice. Well, I can go that way or go this way or I don't have to believe it that strongly or whatever. It's a serious matter with God whether or not that you listen to this message because to whatever extent you give in to some sin, whether it's doubt or a sin of the flesh, whatever, you're departing from the faith. That brings you one step closer to the permanent departing from the faith because all of these who've departed, whether here or elsewhere, started somewhere departing from the faith with a thought in the mind or whatever, justifying the aspirin, whatever, justifying the money they borrowed to buy that car they needed for their ministry, whatever, instead of trusting God. I'm saying that the reason they're departing the faith is because Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 4, 1, they're listening to seducing spirits and the lies of demons. I mean, can't you recognize the devil's voice? I don't see why some people don't understand how they can fall into the snare. He'll come up and say, well, fornication isn't such a bad sin. Everybody's doing it. And that's about the truth. And it isn't any worse sin than lying or cheating on your income tax or criticizing or gossiping. In any way, you can be forgiven. And so they fall into that snare. The devil's lie of God provided drugs and gives the skills to the surgeons and therefore you're going through a serious trial. So why just trust in faith alone? After all, who's Hobart Freeman? I mean, you never heard that till you came to faith assembly. And that's about the truth also. You know, the devil will tell the truth if he can get you to fall away. They try to justify all that, and we've got tapes and sermons and all that on that for anybody that may be visiting and who may not know that even some physicians and surgeons are writing books on the adverse effects of trusting the doctor instead of, you know, just a little common sense sometimes. All sorts of books about the adverse effects of drugs. Hundreds of thousands of cases every year where drugs are crippling and killing and surgeons who are mutilating, and a recent one who cut off the wrong leg of a diabetic, and how would you like to have a bad leg and then lose the good one? Now he's got none, and on and on and on. But you see, that suggestion when you're hurting or where it's your child that is seriously ill can sound very logical. So the devil says, well, God inspired all of this. Well, God would be working against himself. As we said on a message not too long ago, if he's trying to get people healed, and then hundreds of thousands, I don't mean tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and in some adverse effects it's in the millions, every year are being drugged and polluted and cut up and mutilated, then God's working against himself. He's trying to get them healed through medical science. I mean, logic ought to tell you that. Well, I just challenge you to read one or two of those books and anybody that thinks that the doctors are helping them will get their eyes opened. What are banks for? What are finance companies for when you're going through a financial trial, the devil says? He said people will depart from the faith because they give heed not to the word coming from this pulpit, not from the word coming from the Bible, but heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of demons. When you're reading that other religious garbage are when you're sitting alone and letting the devil have his way in your mind. Amen. You depart from the faith because you do not believe the Word of God. And it just brings you one step closer to a permanent departure from the Word of God. And after all, it's easy for Hobart Freeman and Faith Ministries and Faith Publications to stand up there and encourage you to walk by faith and live by faith and owe no man anything, Romans 13:8 and to talk about how he never has to take an offering. You've never seen an offering plate passed in here. How he gets on the radio and never asks for money. It's easy for him to say that because he's got hundreds of thousands of dollars of income a year from the sales of his books and tapes. And that's true. It just increases year after year after year. <laughs> but... The point is, dear friends, I want to set the record straight tonight because it has come to my attention that some people are stumbling over that fact 
and think with all of that income, what could he need any help in faith assembly for? And so there's just a whole lot of people that don't contribute to the work here, and I couldn't care less. I've told you that 10,000 times. I have to make another point tonight. That they think, well, with all of that income, hundreds of thousands of dollars, he surely couldn't need it. And it isn't just one person thinking that. And I've said again and again, in your presence, don't go by outward appearances. I started walking by faith in 1952 when the Lord saved me, and I've said to you again and again, I'm still walking totally, 100%, 110% by faith. Don't go by appearances. The reason that some people are stumbling and not doing what they should and I don't mean give offerings, I mean they're not trusting God for their finances because they say, well, it's easy for him to say that, but all I've got is my job, I'm on a fixed income so much a week, and yet every time he sells a book or tape, that's a potential sale of another dozen, and that's true. And it just keeps expanding, and that's true, it does. And so it's easy for these faith ministers to talk about that because all they have to do is sit back and prepare sermons and preach sermons on faith and tell us to have faith like we've got when they don't have to have faith because they've always got all that income coming in, especially if you've written a few books and have, as I do, hundreds of tapes on the tape list. And because some are stumbling over this, I'm convinced that the Lord wants me to deal with it. And I want to deal with it in such a way that you can make no mistake that God is faithful to do what He says, that we have given our testimony in all sorts of places and in all sorts of ways, and we have over and over, in sermon after sermon, encouraged you to trust God for everything, whether it's healing, finances, or whatever. If you are a Christian, especially a word minister, and can't trust God for your finances, you disqualify yourself. I want to tell you, friends, every one of you that have a job on a fixed income, it takes less faith for you than it does for me, financially. And I'll show you why. But first of all, I want to point out some things. Because you see, what I want to deal with in the rest of the message, the reason some people are departing from the faith, they're misreading other circumstances. And this is just an illustration of that. And I want with all of my heart to encourage you to trust God for your finances because that's what I'm doing. 100%, as I'll show you later. And they're departing from the faith because they're misreading their own circumstances. And they're departing from the faith because they're misreading God's circumstances. So we begin with misreading others, and in this case, misreading my circumstances. But first of all, I want to say the reason that I preach the abundant life in this church is because the Bible teaches it. Amen. I preach it because the Bible promises it. I teach it because it's taught in the Word of God if you meet the conditions. Now, I'm not preaching down to anyone or criticizing anyone because the only way I would know to deal with this is because people have been stumbling over. You see, I've been keeping this a secret for many, many years about my finances and how I trust God. All I've said is don't go by circumstances. I walk by faith. But the first thing is, I want you to see the reason I preach the abundant life and live the abundant life and have the abundant life is because the Word teaches us and I meet those conditions. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You won't have to take thought for your material needs. He says it five times. I don't know what it is to take thought for material things. Since 1952, going bankrupt as a businessman, I've just refused to take thought. And so never fault a person if they're being blessed by God because they're believing His Word, whether it's finances or whatever. Don't stumble over that or you will be tempted not to trust God yourself for finances because you're misreading somebody else's circumstances. If you are the type of person that in the area of healing that you get a healing every time a symptom comes, every time you start through a trial, it's a matter at most, say, of three or four days, I'm not going to fault you for that and get jealous and envious, and I'm not going to pray for him. He's got all the faith he needs. <laughs> I'm not going to contribute anything to faith assembly with all that income. You see the analogy? No, I'm going to rejoice with you if you've got that kind of faith for healing. And if I hear you're going through a trial and that you are a giant of faith in the area of healing, I'm still going to ask the Lord, touch that brother, heal that sister. See, I'm not going to rule you out because you don't need my help. 
You do need my help. Amen. Maybe that's one reason your faith is so strong. But anyway, the reason that I preach abundant life and receive it, and I do have it, is because the Word teaches it, and I meet the conditions. Amen. Mark 10 says, if you forsake it all, I'll give it back a hundredfold. I want to say, I have forsaken it, I have no affection for it, and He's given it back a thousandfold. He'll do what He says if you do what He says. And then the second thing I want to say before I get to what I really want to say is that I have paid my dues over the faith for finances question a long time ago. Oh, I paid my dues. I started walking by faith when I was going bankrupt as a businessman in 1952 when God saved me. I started believing God not just for salvation but for my finances. I didn't go bankrupt. I've never regretted trusting Matthew 6.33 since 1952, January 52. God has never failed me. Many times no income. I never missed a meal. You see. But I suffered all sorts of criticism and ridicule and reviling by the whole college I attended, by the administration and by the faculty. I didn't know what it was to be able to look a person squarely in the face and believe they would treat me just as a fellow Christian. It was a Christian school. They had nothing but contempt for me. All of them that ever heard of me, not that everybody in college heard of Hobart Freeman, but the ones that did, nothing but contempt. And they let it be known. They would sit in the class and say things that were just demon-inspired to me or against me. And hold meetings. The Women's Missionary Society held a meeting to try to get me off my faith walk and have the authorities, somebody move in so I'd quit starving my family to death because he won't work and all of that. He's going to school on faith and blah, blah, blah. And God was providing. Well, my testimony's on tape for anybody who cares to hear it. We'll let you borrow it back there in the lending library. We won't try to sell you a tape lest you say, you know, well, there's some more of that income. But <laughs> it's available. I've paid my dues. I mean to tell you, I learned to walk by faith when I never heard of anybody else walking by faith. And I counted it a privilege to trust God for my finances, and I still do. I wouldn't trade that for all of your money in the world. I've turned down gold mine stock. I just recently, it hasn't been two weeks, turned down stock that a brother wanted to give me worth, I suppose, several thousand dollars. Now, I want to say that he went on and gave some money anyway, but I wasn't going to sign anything. I wasn't going to get involved for money. Money doesn't mean a thing to me. Money's a medium of exchange. That's why we don't take offerings. That's why we don't care who or what puts in back there. You have to watch what you say because you say things like that. Those who count the offering, I never do. I don't know what goes back there. I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you what our financial situation is now any more than the man in the moon. You say, isn't that careless? No, it's faith. It's spelled F-A-I-T-H, faith. But sometimes those who count it say, when you say, well, I don't need it, they take you at your word. <laughs> and the offerings go way down. And then somebody gets up and encourages, well, you've got a responsibility here. Regardless of what his income is, that has nothing to do with your responsibility. You see. And then the offerings go way up for a week or two. <laughs> well, I thank God I'm not involved in it. Somebody has to count it because the tax people come in and say, why didn't you count it? They won't take my word for it, even if I counted it. You know, they're not going to take a minister's word for what he's getting that no one else counts. But anyway, that's beside the point. I'll tell you, dear friends, I have paid my dues in the sense that I have walked by faith when I had no income, when I didn't have a nickel in my pocket, and never missed a meal. And don't owe anybody a penny. Which brings me to the third thing I want to say. That you're going to stumble and depart from the faith. Some people are doing it and will do it if they misread somebody else's circumstances. And so I want to say at this point that lest... Some be encouraged not to trust God. God knows my heart. I have absolutely no ulterior motive. In fact, I've kept this secret for many, many years. But because some are stumbling because they're misreading outward circumstances of others, in this case the pastor's income, then I believe with all my heart he wants me to share it with you so that you will be encouraged to trust God. I didn't say put offerings in the box. I said trust God for yourself. 
Because if you're saying, well, it's easy for him to say that, hundreds of thousands of dollars of income a year, anybody can walk by faith when they know it's coming in like that. So I want to say, dear friends, that I personally have not and do not, I do not receive one red cent from faith publications and faith ministries. Never have, never will, unless the Lord says, I want you to take some of it for yourself. We live 100% by whatever you're laid on the heart to put in that box back there. Always have, always will. I count it a privilege to practice what I preach to you. All of that money that comes in, hundreds of thousands of dollars from sales of books and tapes is the Lord's. It pays for, well, eighty to $90,000 worth of air conditioning in this building without any strings attached. I didn't say, Brother Nye, now sign a contract here that that much of this building's mine. No, it's the Lord's money. And it just, when there are needs like that, big needs, then it goes to that. For the radio programs, just one, KXEL is $13,000 a year, and we're on six or seven stations and planning on going on more stations. That is, we're praying about it. This is to pay all the expenses of getting this word out. It costs quite a bit to run an office like that over there. Just one piece of equipment into the thousands of dollars. And you can go over there and look around and find quite a bit of equipment, besides the salaries, which are not, you know, minimum wage. That's the Lord's money. A long time ago, way back in Claypool, after I had written the little faith book, the Holy Spirit inspired it, so it wasn't mine to begin with. And the little Angels of Light book, which wasn't mine anyway because the Holy Spirit gave it. And I had maybe a couple of dozen tapes on a tape list. And we were so busy, I did it all myself. I didn't have any office. I made the tapes, duplicated the tapes, mailed the tapes, answered the orders, wrote books, preached. I did it all. And when income started to come in from those tapes and books, I sat down and I said, Lord, I've been privileged to trust you by faith alone for all these years. I've been a witness and testimony to others that it does work. Matthew 6.33 works if you don't take thought. And I said, I see what's happening. And some money around 12000 or more got accumulated in the bank. Because, you know, that extra income. And I said, Lord, it's yours. The 12000 went in the barn, went out of the bank into the barn. I said, I'm giving it to you and every penny from here on. I'm not going to commercialize the gospel. Now, every other minister has to make these decisions for himself. But that is my conviction so that I can say, like Paul said, be ye examples of me. I have preached to you that faith works. Faith will work for finances quicker than anything else. The least amount of faith you've got, it'll work for your finances. I mean, if I had to worry about what God would do for me, the last thing I would ever think to worry about is how he would provide my needs. I've had people try to get me to worry. How are you going to make it when I had no income? I don't know. Haven't made it yet. Just trust the Lord. He'll provide. And I would say, if God has any worries, he doesn't. The least worry he'd have is to provide for me financially. If he had a worry. And I've just never understood how people can get so upset about maybe going bankrupt or not having enough income or they've claimed a car and it hasn't come yet and they worry about whether or not they ought to take a substitute or whether God's really going to fulfill Mark eleven twenty four 24 or whatever. I just don't understand that. The easiest thing you can believe God for is material needs. And the second easiest thing is healing. I know some of you don't believe that, but it is. And people and myself and others have been examples in this body. The sister that gave the testimony, she walked out for months a broken collarbone. Every time she'd move, it'd move back and forth. And she didn't go by circumstances. She went by the Word of God. I mean, it does work. Faith works. So I said, Lord... I count it a privilege to trust you as I've been doing for my finances. Every bit of income from sales, books, and tapes, and royalties, which run into a few thousand dollars a year on royalties on those books like that Moody Prince of mine and others, Lagos, I said, all of that's yours. 
Now, this is no glory to Hobart Freeman, but as Paul said, he would make tents with his hands. He would not take anything from anyone, lest some stumble and say, well, he's preaching for profit. Now, of course, the Bible says that he that preaches the gospel is to live by the gospel. And it says in more than one place, you have a responsibility to support those who are feeding you spiritual things with your carnal things, that is, your material goods. We know that's in the Bible. And we believe that if a person loves the Lord, that we'll have no concern about offerings and so forth. But we, from the beginning, live off of a box stuck in the back somewhere, not up here where you couldn't miss it. God provides abundantly. Whatever that will do to offerings, I couldn't care less, but God provides abundantly. But listen, that isn't the whole story. Out of those offerings come all the expenses of the church. We never ask you for money. Be you followers of me in this. We never ask you for a penny. If we have a need, we let God know it's George Mueller. I mean, God has it. <laughs> he's the one that has it, so he's the one that I want to talk to if I had a need, but I don't have a need. Out of that offering comes up to seven to 1300 for utilities a month, the custodian salary, two associate pastor's salary, Jerry's salary, now, I don't mean they're huge amounts, but that's that much every month, over $500 a month for guest speakers. Every time a man stands in the pulpit and I'm not here, that's $100 out of the offerings. Now, that's where it ought to come from, because you are putting it in there because you love the ministry. So why should I take it out of faith publications over there so I can have all the offering? And so there's over $500 a month for guest speakers. The gifts for the needy, there have been over $550 in the past couple of weeks just for needy people who have come up here. That comes out of the offerings. Thousands of dollars for chairs. And yet God provides, I don't know of a thing I need. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When there are big amounts like air conditioning and that sort of thing, faith publications and faith ministries can supply that. It's the Lord's money. This is His building, His church. There wasn't $80,000 in the offerings, you know, to buy air conditioning. Not any month that I can recall. <laughs> I'm saying, dear friends, it works. Amen. Trust the Lord. Amen. I have given my testimony everywhere about trusting God for finances, but I've been keeping this back. And I can see now, now's the time to share that as we started in 1952, walking by faith, trusting the Lord to send it in any way He wants, occasionally some will come through the mail and say, this is for you. Well, praise God. I take them at their word. If they say, use it to spread the gospel, I take them at their word, and it goes, you know, into faith ministries or whatever. But the point is, dear friend, it works. Look what we took on. Look at the expense with the knives and all. This is a work of faith and a walk of faith from the beginning. Amen. So don't stumble over apparent circumstances of others. You can apply that in so many ways. We're trying to give you a principle here. We're not asking for your money. We're trying to encourage you to trust God. Now, I've said on more than one occasion, don't go by circumstances. I'm still walking by faith. But people don't really hear you say that, do they? They look at outward circumstances. Well, that's the Lord's. That's the Lord's. And He will provide as He's been providing, just as He has always done, through me just trusting Him, having the privilege. I count it such a joy and a privilege to be able to stand up here and say, it works. It does work. It's still working. I live the abundant life because I find it in the Word of God. But I live it by God sending it in in His own way and not by selling it. People are encouraged sometimes to depart from the faith because they're misreading other circumstances, in this case, the pastor's income. They thought it was in faith. How could it be faith with all of that money rolling in? But they also sometimes depart from the faith because they misread their own circumstances. For example, they'll pray about a matter and because there's a delay, they will misinterpret that as denial. Remember, as we've said previously, delay does not mean denial. Amen. Or they'll pray about a matter, and because they have to go through a trial before the manifestation, 
The circumstances seem to look worse, you know, negative. And so they'll go by those circumstances. They'll misread what's happening. God allows the trial to mature their faith, but they give up their faith. Well, it's been seven years and still have a restriction on my license. Some people give up the faith just for that. Or, well, I hurt pretty bad. And I'll tell you, friends, I know what it is to hurt, and my heart goes out to people who hurt. I know what it is to hurt in any part of your body. Name one part. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, when the healing doesn't come, you have opened the door to doubt because you're misreading your circumstances. He isn't going to answer me. It's been three days or three weeks or whatever. You've been falling into the snare of misreading circumstances, in this case your own. Delay doesn't mean denial. When the delay is there, the delay simply means that God in His great wisdom has delayed the manifestation for some reason. Generally, it's just to check you out to see where your faith is, head or heart. And somewhere along the line, when you don't get the healing, when you don't get the new car, when the loved one doesn't come into salvation, somewhere along the line, you have opened the door to the spirit of doubt. I don't know where, unless God shows me. I wouldn't know where a person who has to give up faith in God and run to the hospital, or run to the doctor, or run to the finance company, or go to the psychiatrist. I don't know where they open the door, but they open the door. They're departing from the faith at some point. And as I say, I can sympathize with the people after they've made the mistake, and I do. I've said that before. And the people who have fallen away or missed God or departed from the faith at whatever point or however much they know that they don't get criticized in the hospital. They don't get criticized on the bed of the affliction. They don't get criticized when I meet them coming out of the bank after their testimony. I'm going to trust God. He'll provide some way and whatever. But I have to preach the uncompromising message so that you don't make that mistake. You don't open that door. You don't misread your circumstances. You can't rationalize, well, if you just knew how much pain I had. Because somewhere you opened a door that said, God isn't big enough to remove this pain. Somewhere you had to open that. You can't die believing. Amen. You can only die doubting. And if you get the whole story, you find somebody's confessing the negative. Whatever. You'll find it there. When, when, when will everyone that occupies these chairs that we provide for you by faith, when are you all, all of you, going to start believing what we preach from the Word of God? It's so clear a baby can understand it. That you're going to have the trials. You're going to be tempted to give up. You're going to be tested and tempted to depart from the faith at some point. But remember that brings you one step closer to departing permanently. Oh, not from religion, just from the faith. Which is the thing you're going to need in this end time. Because when you depart from the faith, there's nothing God can do for you. God can forgive any sin. But he can't do a thing with doubt and unbelief except judge it. When will you learn? All he can do is judge it. And sometimes it's let you go on and have your operation or go bankrupt or whatever because you've opened a door. God can't do anything with unbelief. We've been faithful to preach that to you. That's the sin Jesus came to die for, our unbelief. And people think because he confessed John 3.16, that's all there is about unbelief. I'm saved. That's only the beginning of a walk of faith. Get your eyes off the circumstances or you'll start confessing them and depart from the faith. Keep your eyes on the Word of God. Whether it's finances, just a meal. You may need a meal, like one brother said after he heard a message on faith. He said, it does work. He said, I didn't have a bit of food, no money, so I just claimed that I'd have breakfast. He said, I claimed bacon and eggs. I'm telling you, don't watch your circumstances. God is faithful. Knock on the door, what, seven or eight o'clock. Farmer there. God woke me up, said, take him some eggs. 
He kept waiting for the bacon, and he said, never gave me the bacon. He'd claim bacon and eggs. And so he didn't get his eyes on the circumstances, get his mind in the realm of the logic. He figured somebody else would bring the bacon. Never came. Well, he had eggs all week. Now, if he'd have followed the logic of the institutional church, he would have said, well, God knows best. Pork's not good for you. Anyone knows that. <laughs> If he'd have followed the logic of some charismatics and some that you know, he would have said, I don't understand why Mark 11:24 works for others, but doesn't seem to work for me. You ever heard that? Well, you were not here last week because that was the message. He said a week later, knock on the door, there's that farmer. He said, here's your bacon. He said, a week ago, God said, take him some eggs and bacon. He said, I didn't obey him. Bacon costs a lot of money. What is it, $2.50 a pound? Well, I can see you don't eat bacon like I do. <laughs> you don't know the price? It's way up there. I don't shop, but my wife sometimes says, enjoy it. It's $6. <laughs> well, well, praise the Lord. So I said, I didn't obey the Lord. Now you see what happens when you look at your circumstances? What if he'd have said, well, God knows best. That's what they're taught to say. He knows that I don't need a white new car. And you take that substitute that the devil gives you, and then you lose your faith. God doesn't send substitutes. Read Luke 11, 9 to 13. If you ask for bread, he says, you don't get a stone, you get bread. If you ask for an egg, you don't get a serpent. If you ask for a fish, you don't get a scorpion. He said, now you wouldn't give those things to children who ask you for bread, fish, or an egg. How much more will your heavenly Father not give things to you that are harmful, but that he will give you what you ask for, is the point. 2 Corinthians 1.20, all the promises of God are already yes in Christ Jesus. So he's trying to get you to say yes, to believe him. And of course, the trials are a part of the blessing to mature you in the faith so that when the bacon doesn't come right away, you don't say, well, I must have missed God, or Mark 11.24 doesn't always work. Apply the eggs-bacon illustration to when you're hurting, when you're about to go bankrupt. Don't look at your circumstances. People are departing from the faith, not trusting God for their finances because they thought, well, he can say that because it's so easy with all that income. And so you're not encouraged to trust God because you say, well, I'll never have that kind of income. I'm no author and I don't have hundreds of tapes and all of that. Now you got no excuse. <laughs> you trust God. He'll provide. Oh, yes. I could thank God for you if he will bless you by letting you have to trust him without seeing where it's going to come from. I walked that way for years. No income, except a little, you know, from filling a pulpit somewhere and that sort of thing. Counted it a privilege, still do. And others are departing from the faith because they're misreading their circumstances, as they do others. And a third reason why some depart from the faith and turn from the promises of God to the help of man is because they're misreading God's circumstances. Now many say, you've heard them say it, you've said it yourself, nothing's impossible with God. God can do anything but fail. God's word is true. And how many times have we had to come to you and say, but in time of your own personal trial, your own need, when things begin to look impossible in your situation, then you really begin to wonder, will this promise on a printed page in the Bible really work for me? That's just a word on a printed page. Or oh, it's easy to tell brother, sister, so-and-so, trust God, have faith in God, when it isn't your trial. And so they're misreading God's circumstances is what I'm saying. But God cannot be separated from that word printed on that page. If you understand what I mean, God and his word cannot be separated. Whatever God has said in this word yesterday is still true today for you. And it will be true a thousand years out there for all of us. Thank God for that. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word has been settled in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, God can change your circumstances down here because His up there never change. 
Whatever he said a thousand years ago is still true today. The reason God can change your circumstances is because his never does. He says, I, the Lord, change not. God doesn't change. You see, the reason that you sometimes think it isn't going to work for you is because when things begin to look bad down here, when things begin to look impossible for you, then you have the tendency to translate that difficulty, serious situation, impossibility to God. The harder it looks to you, the more impossible you think it's going to be for Him to work it out. If it's severe pain, terminal illness, threat of bankruptcy, wife leaves, husband runs off, children are getting worse, you just name the problem. Oh, that's so big. Oh, I don't know. It's so hard for me to solve. I can't even think of a way that I could solve it. It's impossible. You translate that to God and you forget nothing changes in heaven because that is a terminal illness down here. Nothing changes in heaven because your child is sick and seems to be getting worse. Nothing is changed in heaven simply because there's a threat of bankruptcy down here. Nothing is changed in heaven because the devil has invented new ways to oppose the truth. Nothing ever changes in heaven. God does not change. His word does not change. His nature does not change. Just because nations are increasingly declaring war on earth, God does not change. His nature does not change. His word doesn't change because a ship sinks or a plane crashes out of the sky or because this whole world is finding new ways to rebel and sin and rebel against God. God doesn't change. But you tend to translate what's happening down here to Him up there, and so it must be impossible. That's what you're saying. And I'd like for you to turn in conclusion tonight to Psalm chapter 2 because I would like to encourage your heart from what is said there concerning what's happening down here on earth. Psalm chapter 2. People think you know that what happens down here changes God and His character and His word and gets Him all concerned. Why do the heathen rage, the nations rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, Christ, saying, Look what they say. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords or their restraints from us. Now when God listens to all that, and this is certainly an end time picture of what's happening increasingly, does God begin to quake with fear? Does God have to call a special assembly of the angels and his son and say, what are we going to do? When God looks at your serious illness, threat of bankruptcy, or the fact you've had no income for six weeks, does he have to call a council and say, what are we going to do? No, I'll tell you why he doesn't. Verse 4. He that sits enthroned in the heavens shall laugh when the nations rage and rebel and say, let's throw off all of his laws and restraints. He that sits in the heavens when he hears that shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Hold them in contempt. Then he shall speak in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Now that's the God I have faith in. Verse 4. In an unchanging, eternal, sovereign, unmoved God who isn't shaken by every wind that rages down here on earth. Who isn't worried and upset about how he's going to heal you because your illness is serious and getting worse. Who isn't worried about what he's going to do now that the whole world seems to be opposing the faith message in this end time and coming against the word ministry. A God who isn't shaken because you're about to go bankrupt, you have no money. The reason that he can change our circumstances for the better is because his never change. And the reason they don't is because God and his word are based upon what he said. That is to say, his word cannot change. Psalm 119, verse 89. In the next verse, verse 90 says, His faithfulness endures to all generations. 
So the reason he can change our circumstances for the better is because his never do. His word does not change. His faithfulness does not change. What he said is based upon his unchanging word, upon his faithfulness. Conversation reportedly was overheard in the woods some time ago. If you'd been there, you'd have heard this conversation. The robin said to the sparrow, He said, there's one thing I'd like to know. Why it is that these Christians rush about, doubt, and worry so? Said the sparrow to the robin, I've been thinking on this myself of late. I'm sure they're no longer Christians, but have departed from the faith. Amen. Sparrows, bluebirds, robins have considerable sense because Jesus said they trust the Heavenly Father to provide. And how much better are you than many sparrows? If he could just get his people to believe him, to believe his ministers who exhort, plead with you to believe him. When you have that trial next week, next month, whatever, Recall some of these things you've heard. Get the tape recorder out and play those faith tapes over and over and over. If they will heal people who've never heard the message before, they'll heal you. There are cases, and we've told you of some of them, where one woman with terminal cancer, the doctors had given up, listened to a tape somebody shared with her from Faith Assembly on faith got up and was testifying in a meeting where I was speaking. She said, I played that over and over, finally wore it out. I'd played it at least a hundred times. When she wore the tape out, the cancer had been worn out of her body. <laughs> Some people listen 30, 40 times to a tape until they can glean all there is on the tape. Now you know, be honest with yourself, if you've heard it once here tonight, what do I need a tape for? Well, I don't know, you'll have to answer that. They didn't have tape recorders in Jesus' day. That's right, but they had good memories. <laughs> they were trained. They could recite their genealogy all the way back to Adam. So when you can do that, then hearing it once is enough. <laughs> I'm not so sure it's enough because he wrote four Gospels, which all say essentially the same thing. Just approach it like we do from different angles. Trust God. It does work. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, we know that it is faith that will give us the victory which is going to overcome this world and bring us into the place of overcomers. Holiness, righteousness, truth, peace in our hearts, love of one another, all are important. They're all taught in your word. But you've said without faith. You didn't say without love or peace or holiness or righteousness. But you said without faith we cannot please you. Of course, we know we can't please you without these other things. But you chose faith to say that if we don't believe you, then we'll really not have the other things. My prayer is you'll impress upon all those who have ears to hear that they give heed to what you're saying in these last days. Lord, we have warned, we have taught, we've preached, we've exhorted that these things would come to pass, that we're beginning to experience more and more. My prayer is, Father, that we'll be so impressed by the shortness of the time, the seriousness of faith, that we will draw so close to you that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.